may work for Pfizer, so this is a pharmaceutical industrial perspective. So the first slide I'm going to show you is, is a quiz, and we'll have answers at the end. And uh, you know, the main reason I'm asking, showing this quiz is just so. The first question would be, you know, what is the fewest number of toxicology studies needed to get a prophylactic vaccine approved that would not go to women with childbearing potential? And I think everybody knows that for you know small molecules and monoclonal antibodies, you know, there's a lot of toxicology studies done that are needed for approval. Next question is, what is the fewest number of toxicology studies that would be needed to get a prophylactic vaccine approved that would go to women with childbearing potential? Next question is, how many adjuvants have been approved? Um, next question is, how many exploratory toxic toxicology studies are normally conducted for a prophylactic vaccine? How many toxicology species do we normally use for the approval of a prophylactic vaccine? What is the fewest number of doses that could be used to get a vaccine approved? So again, I hope by the end of my talk that everybody will know the answers to all these questions. So a lot of people think what they're working on is, is different. But people that work on oncology believe, you know, oncology is very different than, you know, other therapeutic areas. But since I've been working with vaccines, I believe that vaccines are very different, and they're very different from small molecules or monoclonal antibodies. So again, I think everybody realizes that um, dose multiples um, of clinical doses are not done for vaccines. As you know, for small molecules or monoclonal antibodies, people are dosing um, high in the animals, and they're usually trying to get high multiple of what the dose is for humans, and then people pick the doses for the humans by doing clinical trials. Now, for vaccines, what you're doing is you're using one dose, which is the clinical dose. So there's only one toxicology dose, and that is the dose that the clinical people will be using, and um, you're basically using that dose going forward in the clinic. Again, what I'm going to be talking about is mostly prophylactic vaccines as most vaccines that are um, approved in the clinic are prophylactic vaccines. And again, prophylactic vaccines are be very different than what normally drug companies are trying to prove because you're administering this to healthy subjects. Again, you know, a lot of drugs, you're, you're dosing people that have a disease and are sick, and, you, and you're trying to cure that sickness. But again, for a prophylactic vaccine, you're trying to stop that disease from uh, coming up in that person. And again, we often administer these vaccines to infants and children, and usually when a vaccine is approved, you're dosing a large number of people globally. You're not just dosing you know, millions of people. You're, you can dose tens and hundreds of millions um, of people with a vaccine, which isn't normally done with other drugs. And again, um, you know, I think we see a lot of press about um, you know people being scared of immunization. So again, there is a very high hurdle for um, the safety of a vaccine. We, you don't want a vaccine approved that is going to cause a safety issue because um, you know the media can pick up on that and, and people can be scared um, to immunize their kids. And that is not something that um, any company or regulator or the public would like. So again, very high hurdle for getting um, these prophylactic vaccines approved for, for all those reasons. And as I'll show you, you know, you do, you do not do a lot of toxicology studies um, to get a um, vaccine approved. As I said before, you know, these, the clinical trials are, are very large. You're, you're dosing tens of thousands of people to get a vaccine approved, unlike other drugs, which, you know, you're dosing um, you know, probably thousands of people instead of tens of thousands of people. And the one thing that people don't realize is that, you know, vaccines in general take longer um, and are more expensive to develop than small molecules or monoclonal antibodies. They're not something that are done quickly um, or cheaply. So first I'm going to talk about the dose, the dose schedule um, of toxicology studies that are needed to support vaccines. So as I mentioned before, you need one dose, and that dose is the full human dose where feasible is administered to 
on the animal. So if the, the dose is 10 micrograms in humans, you'll dose 10 micrograms to animals. You don't scale off for body weight or surface area. You're just giving them the exact human dose. Again, the frequency of dosing should be based on a, a time where the, the animal is having an immune response. So again, if you're dosing people every six weeks, you don't have to dose every six weeks in animals. You just have to show that the time period that you're using, whatever, two, three weeks, four weeks, is supported by the immunology data. So you want to make sure that the dosing regimen that you're using in, in, human, in animals um, will support um, a dosing regimen in, in humans. Again, when you're dosing, how many doses do you give? Um, to animals, it's one more than you're going to give them the clinical trial. So it's called N plus one. So if you're going to dose five doses in the clinic, you're going to need to dose six doses in the toxicology study. So what does this mean? It means you need to get the dose correctly because remember you're going to use the clinical dose in the toxicology study and you need to get the frequency. How many doses are you going to dose? in humans because you need to do N plus one in your toxicology study. So again, um, unlike small molecules and monoclonal antibodies where you don't know usually what the dose is going to be in humans and you, you're going up um, in humans and so you see efficacy or safety issue, for vaccines you need to know what that dose in the clinic is going to be and how many doses you're going to give in the clinic before you start your toxicology study. So again, very different than other modalities. So let's talk next about the species that are needed. Again, you normally need one species for prophylactic vaccine. I think people know for small molecules, you're looking at a rodent and a non-rodent, but for vaccines, one species is sufficient. And again, um, common species that are used for vaccines um, are rabbits, mice, rats, pigs, or non-human primates. So again, you don't, there isn't one specific species you have to use. You can use any of the different species um, for getting the prophylactic vaccine approved. But again, the species you pick, you need to show that the antigen is immunogenic in that species. So again, you don't want to use a species that when you dose with the vaccine doesn't have an immune response. The animal that you pick has to have an immune response. And remember before we said you want to give what you're giving in the clinic. So again, the species that you use has to be large enough to receive the full human dose. So normally vaccines, 0.5 ml, it would be really difficult to get 0.5 ml um, intramuscularly to a 300 gram rat or a 30 gram mouse. So again, you don't often use the rat or the mouse as your only species just because the volume um, won't, would not work, in, especially in the mouse. So often you might use a rabbit, a pig, or a non-human primate just because of the dose volume. But again, the most important thing is to get um, in the species that has response. So again, general design of uh, a toxicology study for vaccines. Again, this is where there's a lot of similarity um, between what you do with the um, small molecules and monoclonal antibodies. So again, as room administration in the clinic, you should use the same um, in the tox. So if it's going to be IM in the clinic, you should use IM in, in the tox. If it's sub-Q in the clinic, you should use sub-Q um, in the tox. And again, you know, depending on how you're delivering your vaccine, is it, is it by needle, is it, um, you know, whatever way it is, you should use a similar device that in the animals that you're doing in the clinic. So what you normally do um, is a uh, recovery or observation period after dosing. So once you do your whatever N plus one, you would have a recovery period um, after your last dose to, to, to see what happens to the animals. So again, these studies can be you know a lot longer to get into the clinic than um, other modalities because you know you could be dosing four, five, six times, you know, spaced two to four weeks. And then you're looking at a recovery period. So again, these studies in, in for tox can last um, a few months. Another difference is um, you're using two controls. Uh, normally, you only have one control, but um, we often use a saline control. And then what the vehicle of the um, vaccine is going to be. So again, two controls of saline and vehicle control. So one other thing that you do is you normally take uh, more ClinPath samples because you 
you'd be taking a ClinPass sample um, after each um, dose. Again, you're looking at a body weight and body temperature to see about the immune response. Um, and again, you're either doing this right before and right after the dose and during recovery. So you take a lot more of these samples than you would normally. <clears throat> again, another big difference is you do not do TK or PK um, on the antigen or adjuvant. So you do not you normally do metabolism studies. What you're looking for is the immunogenic response. It's not the level of the vaccine. So again, that's it's very different than what we do with monoclonal antibodies or um, small molecules. So uh, what, what's the regulatory um, thing around toxicology studies? Again, as I said before, um, you don't do normally a lot of toxicology studies for the vaccine as long as you got the dose and frequency correct. So as uh, one of the questions I asked before, if you're dosing women of childbearing potential, then you need, normally need just to do two studies um, to get um, vaccine approved. And what you're looking at is a general toxicology study in the appropriate species, and you're looking at doing a reproductive toxicology um, in the appropriate species. Now, if you're dosing patients that do not include women of childbearing potential, um, you can um, get approval with the vaccine with just one study, just a general toxicology study would be needed. So again, you're doing a lot less studies um, for vaccines than you would be for small molecules or monoclonal antibodies. Now, based on the regs, um, I believe the USA is the only country that you can recruit women of childbearing potential um, without having reproductive toxicology studies. So the rest of the world, you need to have the reproductive toxicology study um, done before you can dose women with childbearing potential. So what that means is that you can do all of your toxicology studies before the phase one starts, and toxicology would be um, done, and, and you would um, that would be all you needed for the approval of that vaccine. Now, specifically, for the FDA, and I'll explain why this is later, um, you can often have a pre-IND meeting to talk about what the toxicology study should be with fever before you start the toxicology study. And, and normally when we're going to the FDA, we often have this pre-IND meeting to make sure the study that we're doing um, is sufficient to get into the clinic. And again, I'll, I'll describe some differences between some of the countries to say why, why we do this. And again, um, pretty basic. You know, our toxicology studies are done um, via good laboratory practices. So what material do you need um, for the toxicology study? So again, what you're dosing the animals of the test article um, using the studies should be from lots manufactured with the same production process, formulation, um, and generally the same characterization that you're going to use for um, the clinical use. So again, what you what you're going to dose in the clinic is what you want to dose in your um, toxicology study. So you know again we'll talk a little bit about this later on. What does that mean if you start changing um, production for the vaccine? Does it, um, how how different does it going to be before you need to do another toxicology study? All right. So adjuvant um, again, I think companies are using adjuvants more and more. And again, you're adding an adjuvant to the antigen to boost the immune response. So the antigen is going to give you the immune response, but you're adding an adjuvant to, to boost that immune response. Now, most regulators, um, you know, they want adjuvants to be safe, but they also want to show that <laughs> it's augmenting the immune response. So you're, you're trying to get an adjuvant that, that's boosting the immune response, but, but it, it's safe um, in, in every other way and that this adjuvant is actually, you know, doing something. So I think people are very familiar, familiar with aluminum salts. And again, these were the, the first adjuvants um, and only approved until recently uh, before strict regulations were enforced. And there's also a limit as to how much aluminum can be used. So again, um, the aluminum salts have been around for decades, um, and, and regulators are usually pretty comfortable um, with the aluminum salts. But besides um, these aluminum salts, there's only a few other adjuvants that have improved with um, antigens. I think there's um, about two other adjuvants, um, novel adjuvants besides aluminum salts, that, that have been improved with the, with the um, 
the vaccine. So again, it's up to the company to show that this adjuvant is necessary, that when you add the adjuvant, you're seeing a boost to the immune system with that antigen. So the adjuvant is actually doing something. It's not just there. Um, and if you, you dose the antigen alone, um, that when you dose with the adjuvant, you see a lot more immune response and that that adjuvant is, is safe. And I have safe in quotation marks because, again, if you're boosting the immune response, you know, is that toxicity, you know, that's what you're trying to do. But you don't want the adjuvant to do anything else but boost the immune response. And again, um, PK studies are not needed um, for the adjuvant. You need to show that it's, it's helping with the immune response, but there may be a need for distribution studies depending um, on, on the adjuvant. So, um, one other question I asked is how many adjuvants can improve? Uh, again, specific adjuvants are not approved. What's approved is the antigen adjuvant vaccine. So, um, you know, you don't, even the lumen salts are not approved. They're approved with a specific vaccine. And that said, a vaccine can also have more than one adjuvant um, approved. Again, you can, you know, use a lumen salt with another adjuvant. So, again, specific adjuvants are not approved. It's the vaccine which contains the antigen and adjuvant that is approved. Now, if there's no master file for this adjuvant, then you will also need to test the adjuvant alone in toxicology studies. So you would need to do a toxicology study of where you're testing the entire vaccine, the antigen and adjuvant, and then another group where you just test the adjuvant alone. And again, what you're trying to show is that that adjuvant um, is safe. Now, again, if the adjuvant is not approved, depending on what you see, depending on um, how many doses and what patient population you know, the regulations say, you may need to also do additional studies on that adjuvant, um, you know, including general tox, reproductive toxicology, human toxicity, carcinogenicity, and or safety farm. Um, and again, if you're dosing higher or more frequent of a specific adjuvant, you will need to do a specific toxicology on that adjuvant, even if the adjuvant um, has a master file. but it has a lower dose or less frequency. Um, at the present moment, there's a, a HESI proposal. Um, a couple of companies are trying to get together um, to influence um, regulators in terms of adjuvants, since, again, um, there are not many um, new novel adjuvants that have been approved with antigens. And uh, the proposal is the association of autoimmunity with adjuvants and vaccines. So, again, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see um, a couple more things on this slide. Is that you know there's only there's not many companies that are working on vaccines, um, but the large companies are, are trying to get together um, to work together to um, to you know, help with approval with um, adjuvants and or um, vaccines. The next thing I wanted to talk about um, was uh, looking at residuals and contaminants that sometimes get into vaccines. And again, what we what we have is that there's no specific regulatory guidance available for safety assessment of vaccine residuals or contaminants. So, um, again, we'll talk on the next slide, you know, what we're trying to do to change that. So, you know, why is there no guidance um, for, for vaccine residuals and contaminants? And, again, you know, um, you know this could be threefold. Uh, it could be other things. And, again, as I said before in, the, in one of the first slides, there's a very high safety hurdle for vaccines. So, again, you know, the safety hurdle, again, because you're dosing a lot of people, you're dosing healthy people, you're dosing infants um, and children, and, and you're, you're dosing globally a ton of people, um, again, there's, there's a very high safety hurdle for vaccines. The other thing um, I think people realize, especially regulators, is that guidances are usually pretty broad. You don't want to have a guidance that um, is, is very specific because it's not, it's not going to be a very um, used guidance. And again, um, you know, getting a guidance just for vaccines alone, which again, you know, you're not, you know, people are not um, getting vaccines approved, you know, every day, is it might be difficult. So, um, and again, the other thing is, is when you have a, a new residual or contaminant, you know, is this chemical interfering with the efficacy um, of the vaccine? The safety of that contaminant or, or residual might be fine, but is this affecting the efficacy of the vaccine? So. Again, um, as I said before, there's a few companies that are, um, you know, trying to come up with a proposal of, you know, what regulators maybe should be looking at um, for vaccine residual contaminants. Because again, 
Um, there isn't any guidance that, that helps out with this. So again, you have the ICH-Q3A, um, which would, would have, you know, talks about impurities that, you could, that we could look at. Um, again, there's the ICH-Q3B um, also, which looks at um, impurities. But again, these two guidances exclude biological and biotechnological products, which, you know, does two vaccines fall under that um, or not? Now, the ICH-23C um, doesn't have an exemption for biological or biotechnical products, but it doesn't specifically mention vaccines. And I, and I think people also know about the EMEA um, Threshold for Toxicological Concern guidance. So again, these are some of the guidances that are out there that um, you know could be used for um, figuring out um, a level um, of safety for residuals and contaminants that will come up in a um, in a vaccine. So again, um, regulators and, and how they look at vaccine. Um, you know, there, there are um, some differences between the USA, EU, Japan, and uh, the rest of the world. And again, as I said before, you know, there are not a lot of regulatory um, guidances for vaccines. Um, again, there is an EMA, EMA um, guidance, the WHO guidance, and um, Japan has recently come out um, with the guidance. So that said, the FDA does not have a guidance for um, getting um, for non-clinical um, you know, back, get vaccines. So again, as I mentioned before, um, Pfizer often has a pre-IND meeting with them because they, since they do not have a guidance, um, we, we submit our protocols to them before we start toxicology studies and ask them if what we're doing is, is sufficient. And I've listed uh, the guidances below. Again, you know, the, the WHO guidance, um, people use, and again, a lot of what I discussed about dose, number of species, the N plus one um, is on that guidance. And again, um, there's the EMA guidance, which was uh, uh, written in 1997. And, um, and again, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the PMDA has come out with the new guidance. And again, if you look at the guidances, they're all um, now pretty similar. So uh, I believe um, not this wasn't the case a few years ago, but now uh, I, I think the USA, the EU, and Japan, and the rest of the world are, are pretty similar on what you need to do um, for toxicology to get the um, vaccine approved and, and into the clinic. But again, the FDA will tell you they do not, they, they do not, they, these guidances are out there, but they're not FDA guidances. So uh, I think it behooves companies um, when they're going to the FDA to talk to them first to make sure that they're doing um, the right study. So what I talked about before is when you're dosing toxicology studies, you really want to use what you're going to be dosing in, in the clinic. So um, again, you want to get it right before you start the, F the first in human. You, you, you don't want to have to keep on changing the manufacturing of the vaccine because that might um, behoove you to do more toxicology studies. So um, again, if you have to repeat the toxicology study, um, it's going to take time to run the toxicology study, so you might not be able to go into the clinic until the toxicology study is done. And also, there's always a cost of running these toxicology studies. So when you, if you're trying to manufacture a vaccine, you're trying to improve it, Again, this should really be happening a lot before you dose um, first in human, because if you dramatically change the processes um, or adding new recipients after you do a toxicology study, you might need to repeat um, that toxicology study. And again, this is going to cover the entire um, vaccine, which would be the antigen, the antigen, the adjuvant, and many other components of the vaccine. So again, I think people for small molecules, monoclonal antibodies, what they try to do is improve the process, um, you know, make it, you know, you know, less contaminants, you make it cheaper throughout the development of the drug, but that is not what you want to do with vaccines. What you want to do with vaccines is, is basically try to have a pretty good process before you get in the clinic, so you're not doing dramatic changes and, and have to repeat toxicology studies. So again, what I said was the minimum number of toxicologies, you know, could be one or two, but that's if you get it right. If you keep on changing the vaccine, you have the dose wrong, you have to so it's more frequent, 
you can be repeating um, the toxicology studies until you get what you need to get into the clinic um, correct or and or if you're, you're changing the formulation dramatically. So again, you know, small changes in formulation, if you can show there is not um, going to be a big difference, then you might not be, have to do um, another toxicology study. But again, it's up to the company to to show that that, that, that small difference isn't, isn't going to matter, which can be difficult sometimes. So I just want to talk really quickly about therapeutic vaccines. And what I was talking mostly about before was really prophylactic vaccines, which, which makes up the majority of, of the vaccines out there. So again, therapeutic vaccine might not have the same safety hurdles um, as a prophylactic vaccine, depending on the indication, because again, the risk benefit um, can be different. Because with these therapeutic vaccines, you are usually dosing um, a, a sick person. So you're not dosing a healthy person just trying to stop the disease. With these therapeutic vaccines, you're, you're dosing somebody who's sick. So again, it's easier to do a risk-benefit um, profile compared to a prophylactic vaccine. And again, I think everybody knows some of these therapeutic vaccines are for oncology. So again, um, you know, the, the, the benefit could really, um, you could have some toxicity possibly that would um, outweigh, outweigh the risk. So therapeutic vaccines can have different safety hurdles depending on the patient population and or um, and the disease. So again, um, there are very limited guidances on these therapeutic vaccines. You know, I don't. There's not many therapeutic vaccines approved. So um, again, I think it behooves companies to to talk to regulators more often on these therapeutic vaccines to make sure the studies that they're doing is appropriate for the regulator. Because again, uh, there's not a lot of guidances for therapeutic vaccines. Now the other thing that can be very different with these therapeutic vaccines is that for some of them you might have to uh, use disease animal models. So again, if you're looking at a vaccine for let's say something like Alzheimer's disease and you're looking at reducing plaques, um, if you're dosing normal animals that don't have these plaques, it might not be the de best tox species. So again, you might use, need to use disease model um, animals for toxicology and or efficacy studies, which again, you don't normally do um, with other modalities, you're normally using normal animals. But again, um, if, you, if you need to answer the safety, you might use, need to use a disease animal model. So again, let's go over the uh, answers to, um, to the quiz. So what is the fewest number of toxicology studies needed to get a vaccine, a prophylactic vaccine approved that would not dose limit child member potential? Again, you can do one general tox study. If you got that, the dose, the manufacturing, and the frequency correct, um, if you're, if you're lucky enough to do that, you can uh, get um, have do one toxicology study for an approval of a, um, a vaccine. Uh, next question is, you know, how many toxicology studies would you need um, to get um, prophylactic vaccine that would include women of childbearing potential? And again, you would need to run uh, two studies, a general tox study and a reproductive toxicology study. And as I mentioned before, um, when you're dosing women with childbearing potential um, in any country outside the USA, you will need to run um, this reproductive toxicology study before you dose women with childbearing potential, which again um, is different than the new guidance that allows you to dose women with childbearing potential with um, correct um, ways to prevent people from getting pregnant. Again, how many adjuvants have been approved? Again, no adjuvants are approved. Trick question. Again, adjuvants, I said, are not approved. They're only approved with a specific antigen. So the whole vaccine, which includes that adjuvant, are approved. That adjuvants are not, not approved. And again, um, to get an adjuvant approved with an antigen, you have to show that adjuvant's actually doing something and that it is safe. How many exploratory talk studies do you normally run for a prophylactic vaccine? Um, zero. Um, again, you run exploratory talk studies often for monoclonal antibodies or a small molecule because you need to figure out what dose will be, um, you can run in the GLP study. But again, remember, you're not doing any dose setting for prophylactic vaccines. The dose is the dose that you're planning on using in the clinic. So you don't run an exploratory tox study to pick that dose. Um, the people in research and clinical will tell you what the dose should be used um, in the toxicology study. Again, how many tox species do you normally use? Uh, one. 
I think people know, you know, for uh, small molecules, you, you know, you need to run at least a rodent and a non-rodent. And, uh, again, you know, for reprotox studies, you can use a rabbit. And when you go into Carson studies, you're using a mouse and a rat. So, again, um, for other modalities, you could be using four more species. For prophylactic vaccine, uh, again, one tox species that's the appropriate tox species um, is all that you need. Uh, what is the fewest number of doses that you could be used to get a vaccine approved? Um, again, the answer would be two. Remember, it's n plus one. So if you're only dose, you're planning on dosing one um, one dose in the clinic, um, your your tox study could be two doses, and that would be all that you would need. Um, to get um, to get approval. So again, um, two doses would be the lowest number. And that is um, the end of my presentation. So uh, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to, to ask or, or raise your hand or however um, you want to do this. But thank you. Thank you, Martin. Dr. Matsumoto? Hello, uh, my name is Neil Matsumoto, and I'm a regulator in PMDA, and, and I'm involved in the assessment, non clinical assessment of vaccines. I have a question about uh, uh, talk studies for adjuvant along drip. So, how many, how many animal species is required for uh, talk studies for uh, adjuvant along drip? So, again, when you're when you're testing a novel adjuvant, what you, what you normally do is you're adding a another group on to the study that you're getting the vac that you're doing the vaccine for. So if you're let's say using rabbit um, as a tox species and, and you're going to do four doses in the clinic, you would do five doses of the vaccine, which would include the adjuvant, and then you would do another group that you would dose five doses of the adjuvant alone. So again, you're you're you can um, if you're not seeing anything with the adjuvant, just add it on to your general tox study and mm -hmm. your reprodu reproductive toxicology study if you're having women with childbearing potential, and mm -hmm. just add another dose group where you're dosing the adjuvant. So again, that would be the minimum. But then you need to know what is that adjuvant, what is known about that adjuvant. You know, do you, do you, is there a concern for carcinogenicity on that adjuvant? Um, so again, it's up to the company and the regulator to look at that adjuvant, you know, how novel it is it, and what other toxicology studies would you need. So the minimum would be you're, just, you're doing what you do for the vaccine and just add another dose group. But again, you really need to know what that adjuvant is doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, but m my understanding is that adjuvant uh, is the new chemical uh, component of the new chemical uh, entities. So just as the small molecules, uh, the talk study for adjuvant to long drip is basically uh, uh, should be done for two animal species compared to the only one species for uh, the vaccine formula. So that's what the uh, EMA guideline, uh, EMA guideline for adjuvant says. So uh, we uh, we think we consider that we need to follow that rule. So what do you think about? <laughs> so you would do two a rodent right. and non rodent? Right. Uh, rodent and non rodent non rodent. So that's where uh, that's what we are thinking about now. Yeah, so again, um, you know, i think it makes sense for a novel adjuvant to uh yeah, to dose um the, you know, whatever could be the rabbit and, and a rat. And you know, we often uh we often do that with the novel adjuvant, but you have to make sure that the rat has an immune response mm -hmm. from that adjuvant. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so that that makes sense. Using two species for a novel adjuvant, um, uh -huh. one one that uses the vaccine, and another animal species, the rat um, or whatever that has an immune response. So, so yeah, I would think two two species would be good for a novel adjuvant. Okay. So our basic uh, our basic opinion is two animal species are required for us a novel completely novel uh, adjuvant along drips. So that's our opinion. So I have another yep. question about yes I have another question about the uh, adjuvant along uh, general toxicity studies for uh, adjuvant along drips. So does the 
does this uh, general toxicity studies for adjuvant alone group need to follow N plus one rule just as the vaccine formula do it? So again, I, I think it, I think it does. Um, huh? You know, again, with with the one species, you're usually adding another group um, on to compare it to your vaccine, the adjuvant alone. So if you're dosing six doses um, with the vaccine, I think it makes sense to dose six doses with the adjuvant. Okay. Uh, not, I mean, again, it would be interesting to see, do you think that the N plus one applies? I, I think it does. Yeah, so, yes, we, uh, we, also, we also think that we need to, uh, the N plus one rule uh, should be applied to the adjuvant one group also. Yep, makes sense. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Dr. Yamasaki. Uh, could I ask a question about the adjuvant also? Uh, uh, this is Hideki Yamasaki from uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals. So in the slide number uh, 10, uh, you mentioned that we need a carcinogenesis study for the adjuvant. At eight, and now, so you thought uh, we need a uh, risk regulatory administration, the argument. So, even in that case, uh, we need a calcium resistance study in argument for argument? No, so what I'm trying um, to say here, and it'd be interesting what the regulators think, is that um, with the adjuvant, it's it's not it's not like the vaccine. You, you know, you you might have to do additional studies depending on what you see with the adjuvant. So if you if you, let's say you use an adjuvant that's genotoxic positive, the name is positive, then you might have to run a carcinogenicity study to show that you know that 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 genotoxic you know is not going to run to to a tumor or safety form study. So I'm not saying you have to run these, that you could. Um, have to run additional studies depending on uh, the adjuvant and, and the novel and, and, and what it's doing. So yeah, I, um, I, don't, I don't think, again, the guidance is, um, you know, just says you might have to run these depending on, on what you see. It doesn't mean you have to run them. And again, I don't, I don't know of any um, adjuvant that has run a carcinogen study, but this is what the, the guidance um, says, that you might have to run additional studies um, that you wouldn't have to run for the vaccine. But I would like to hear somebody from PMBA um, how they look at that um, guidance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And also, uh, in slide number six, uh, you said, uh, we also need uh, two control for the uh, general tox study uh, for vaccine. Uh, but uh, so in the and I consider about the manufacturing process of uh, vaccine. Uh, sometimes we couldn't make uh, vehicle control, vehicle itself, uh, which means uh, we can't make an uh, adjuvant uh, alone uh, before the critical uh, non critical study. Uh, so you, you can't make the vehicle control, or you can't make the adjuvant alone. What, what was the question? Uh, so, the vehicle, uh, do you mean the vehicle is meaning the uh, vaccine, uh, it excludes the uh, Antigen is right. But yeah, so this is um, the design of this study is, is two controls, um, and then it could be you know an adjuvant alone, and then the vaccine that has the antigen and and the vaccine. So again, you know saline hopefully is not doing anything to your animal, and then you're adding the vehicle control because again these formulations can be very different um, for the vaccine. So you want to see. Is that vehicle, the formulation alone without the adjuvant or antigen or combination, doing anything in terms of changing you know, immune response toxicity? So that's normally what we do is to say, what is the saline doing that's doing that shouldn't be doing anything? What is the vehicle control doing? And then again you can have the adjuvant alone and the vaccine. Okay, thank you. I don't, does anybody from PNDA want to um, go over um, what the slide 10 talking about the additional studies for an adjuvant? Okay, so I remember that Dr. Yamazaki, Yamazaki uh, talked a little bit about the carcinogenicity study uh, for adjuvant along drips, uh, but my opinion is that uh, uh, although this slide 
uh, tells us about uh, carcinogenicity study, but uh, we think that uh, this carcinogenicity study is not necessarily required even for adjuvant lung drip, because uh, you, as you might know, uh, ICHS1 said that uh, carcinogenicity studies is required only when the application is prolonged uh, for about six months, uh, uh, repeatedly uh, for about uh, six months or so, but uh, we think that uh, as then, uh, uh, it can, uh, this rule uh, is not it's not, uh, couldn't be applied to adjuvant long adjuvant, so we don't think, uh, uh, although genotoxic study is required, certainly required for adjuvant long drip, a carcinogenicity car study is not requ necessarily required for uh, adjuvant, adjuvant long drip. That's what I, uh, that's our opinion. Yep, yeah, again, I don't, I don't think anyone, any guidance saying it's required, it's just, it, it could happen, but I agree with you. Um, you know, it wouldn't follow any of the guidance because you're not you're not going to normally dose for six months. So uh, again, this is this is something that could be done, but I don't think it hasn't done in the past. Um, so yeah, I think you're um, you're you're correct. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, I'm just not clear. Uh, Dr. Asakura. Oh yes, uh, this is Shoja Asakura from ASI. Uh, I have a question for the general talk study for prophylaxis. A vaccine, and the, uh, how, how so the, we can do that only one study uh, as a general talk study, but how, how to evaluate the safety pharmacology parameters? Do you, uh, do you include, do we include that parameters in the general talk study, or we don't need to worry about that? No, again, I, I think uh, as the PMBA will tell you, um, you know, safety farm is important in and what you you know you want to do is add safety farm endpoints onto that general talk study. You know, do uh, um, you know an FOB? You know, you can do some uh, ECGs. So again, you can either do a standalone safety farm study, or you, you would have to add that on to the one general talk study. So again, if you're going to do just one study, you, 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 especially for the uh, PNDA guidance, you'll need to add on safety farm endpoints onto, onto that study. Okay, thank you. Yes, but can I add a comment on that? Absolutely. Yes, uh, but the uh, important thing is cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular evaluations. Uh, as you might already know, uh, ICH-S7B says that the cardiovascular evaluation should be done upon non-rodents. So uh, if the talk, uh, general talk study for a uh, vaccine is done uh, only for rodent, uh, independent study for uh, safety pharmacology should be done additionally on non-rodent. So that's the important thing. Yeah, no, you're, you're correct. You're not going to do, uh, yeah, a cardiovascular on, on, on a rat or, or a rabbit. So, yeah, you would need to get an appropriate talk species that you could do um, a cardiovascular assessment on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it depends on what your talk species is. If it's not even primate, you could do cardiovascular if it's a rat or mouse. Yeah, you'll need to do um, another study. Again, that's the minimum. You know, I don't, I don't know of many vaccines that uh, you're going to get approved just one or two studies. You're going to probably need to do something else. Thank you. Okay. So could I, could I ask uh, about uh, risk uh, about uh, safety pharmacology again? And the maximum sense is uh, we need to evaluate uh, cardiovascular pharmacology endpoint uh, using the non rodent uh, I understand that opinion. Okay. Uh, so uh, during the, uh, for repeated dosing, uh, if we uh, evaluate a lab, in that case, uh, we don't have uh, any immunogenicity data for the monkey or dog. Uh, in that case, uh, do we need a uh, immunogenicity study for the, for the non rodent I mean, I think you have to have an appropriate species, so you have to show that there's an immune response from the vaccine in the in the in the dog or the monkey. Otherwise, it's not a valid study; it wouldn't be a valid species. So, I think you need to know the immune response in in the non-rodent to um, to assess the cardiovascular. But again, I would love to hear what the MDA has to say about that. 
Okay, I have a comment on that. So ideally, uh, immunogenicity for monkey, uh, uh, non-rodent, including monkey, uh, should be evaluated. But uh, sometimes uh, it's practically, uh, we understand that it's sometimes practic practically difficult. So, but uh, in general, in general, uh, uh, in general, we understand that uh, rabbit and monkeys uh, uh, vaccine have, tend to have a very high uh, immunogenicity to vaccine. So, uh, even without uh, immunogenicity evaluation, uh, that can be worth to uh, the safety pharmacology is still worth to do. That's our that's we. And that's all opinion. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nakamiko, do you have another comment? Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry. Okay. Are there other, other questions or comments? No, I Dr. Finkelstein, do you want to maybe say um, just a couple of words about, um, you mentioned the fact that the uh, proposal has come in to have the, um, that, that you've been working on along with some, some colleagues who explore um, the association of audit community with adjuvants and vaccines. Um, it looks like that, that project is going forward. Um, anything you want to say in terms of opportunities for, for people to engage in that discussion and participate in that project? So again, um, it, it's really just uh, recently. Um, this this has started. So we even we had not had um, our first meeting, so um, it, it's it's probably premature um, to discuss this. But you know, main thing I just want to say is you know, um, just recently um, the HESI proposal looking at residual contaminants. You know, companies from you know a few companies from around the world are getting together to and working together to discuss this. So. Uh, I hope in the next, you know, year or two, we'll um, be getting something out of these proposals from multiple companies to to present to regulators um, and get their buy-in. And I would really uh, appreciate the uh, PMDA people calling in and uh, and adding their input. It was, it was very insightful. Thank you. Yeah, and, and certainly just to, to sort of expand on that a little bit, all of all of the HESI programs will involve both the company representatives as well as the academicians and regulatory scientists really at all stages of the project. So although the proposal sort of participates within the companies that are generating these products, um, once it does become a more fully fledged HESI program, I think there would be a um, great deal of opportunity and um, importance to have um, the industry, academia, and government all participating in that program. So I would certainly uh, invite you. We will um, be sure to send more information about that project as, as it evolves. But as you said, it's uh, very much in the idea formulation stage, but it does look like it will uh, begin to move forward hopefully sometime in the next few months. Right, and absolutely academia and, and, and industry and, and government uh, regulatory uh, work together to, to make sure that we're um, all aligned. So, um, yes, but it, we just haven't started that yet. 